Today we are going to focus on how I make my sandwich bread. So I do this with active dry yeast so it is not a sourdough. I will make a sourdough sandwich bread video later on sometime. But right now this one is with the active dry yeast. So I buy my active dry yeast in bulk from Azure Standard and I do, I do have a lot more in the fr freezer outside but I have a small portion of it in this glass jar in the freezer inside. So I get it out the freezer and then I am going to put, <clears throat> sorry, I am going to put two teaspoons of the active dry yeast in the bowl and I do have one and one thirds cup of water warming up on the stove. I want it to warm up just a little bit, kind of like baby bottle temp or even cooler than that. Um, if you have it too high, it will kill your yeast and then your bread will not rise, it will come out like a brick. So I have it warming up just long enough for me to add everything that I need into this bowl. So here I'm getting honey, you can use whatever sweetener you would like, but I do use about a tablespoon of honey whenever I make my bread. Some breads I'll put more honey than others, but for my sandwich bread I do about a tablespoon. And then I'm going to be adding about, oh I don't know, maybe a tablespoon of butter to it as well. So we do like the butter, it does help it to not be quite as crumbly. And um, so I do like to add the butter in that. Some people will add oil to it. I just, I like, I just, I like to stick with the butter. So stick with something, you know, that's tried and true. So I'm going to be putting the butter in here and then I will be measuring out that water and getting that water mixed up with the yeast and the honey and butter. The water will help wake up the yeast since I did just get it out of the freezer. So it's pretty, pretty dormant, pretty frozen. So that warm water will help wake it up, get it active, and then it will help the butter and the honey to start melting and dissolve. And you do want that sweetener in there whenever you wake up your yeast because it's going to need something to start eating on. And so whenever, after you add the water and you've kind of mixed everything together to get it all stirred up and woken up, you'll see that it, there's kind of like this foamy explosion after a few minutes. And that's that yeast really waking up it found that whatever sweetener you used and it's it's eating on that it's very very happy and so when you see that happening you know you're gonna have a good bread and that it's safe to go ahead and start adding your flour so I'm checking the water here it feels a little warm to the touch a little warm warmer than normal than I used to uh, that I like to use it and so um, <laughs> no I do not have a proper <laughs> <laughs> thermometer. This is my meat thermometer, but it works just fine. I use it for everything other than meat. <laughs> so it is at a temperature. It's a little warmer than I really like, but it was still okay. It wasn't going to kill the yeast or anything. So I go ahead and I pour it in here and I get all of that stirred up so it can start making that foam and start having that, that feeding reaction that I'm looking for before I add the flour. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to go and get the einkorn flour. When I grind it, I, I grind a bulk of it and I put it in a gallon size bag and stick that in the freezer. Because when you fresh grind flour, since you have the hole and everything attached, it will go rancid after about 12 to 24 hours. So what I do is I grind it in bulk and I stick it in that gallon bag and sticking it in the freezer, that helps preserve it. You can't just leave it sitting out on the counter or whatever you keep your all-purpose flour in that you get from the store because it will go rancid. You'll lose really all of your nu nutrition that's in it, all the nutrients. So um, to help preserve it, to help keep it as fresh as possible, if you're not going to use all of it right away, just stick it in the freezer and that way you don't have to grind something every single time you need to make something with flour. 
So since I don't have much here and I do need to grind some more, I'm going to use everything that's in this bag. And it does come out to be about 245 grams of flour. I do measure with the scale um, because my bread comes out the same way every single time if I do that. If I try, depending on the time of year or the day or how the humidity is, if I try to measure it out with the measuring cups, it will come out different just about every time. So I do use the scale and I like, I like the end result that I get. So now I'm doing 245 grams of the all-purpose flour. So I am doing a half einkorn and a half all-purpose. Now I, I'm doing 245 because the einkorn, it does keep it a little more on the sticky and uh, softer side of dough. If you're doing all of your flour is going to be all purpose, then I would suggest doing, like instead of doing 245 and 245, I would do, I would do four, yeah, 400, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to do math real quick in my head and watch this. I will do 480 grams of just the all purpose and kind of go from there. If it's still a little liquidy, you can add a little flour while it's mixing. So I did do six grams of the Redmond's Real Salt and then one egg. And so that's all I'm going to be putting in here. And then I'm going to mix it on low for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then when it gets to 15 to 20 minutes to get that, um, here I'm going to be grinding some more einkorn. But to get that gluten nice and active, uh, I let it go for 10 to 15 minutes. You don't I mean, even if your dough is still a little moist, you don't want it just super sticky on your fingers. So I will wait that amount of time. And, you know, while it's mixing, I'm going to go ahead and I need more einkorn. So I'm going to go ahead and grind my einkorn flour. I'm adjusting where I like it to be. This is a stone. It does use stone to grind it with this, uh, with this mill. And so I, I adjust my setting and I listen for those stones touching. I like to do it where the stones are touching because that is the texture that we like. It's almost, it makes a fresh ground flour almost like an all-purpose flour texture. And so I do listen for my stones touching and then I go ahead and I add my wheat berries in there to grind. So here I'm checking on my dough. It does need a little bit more flour. And so I'm going to do, I am using a one-third uh, measuring cup here, but I am doing about a teaspoon or two of flour at a time. You don't want to add too much flour all at one time because you can um, add flour, but if you add too much, you know, you kind of ruin it. You can't take it back out. So I do add a little bit at a time and let it just mix for a little bit longer while I'm over here dealing with the grain mill. And then I'll go back and check it and see what's going on with it. Okay, so I'm going to let it mix a little bit longer and see it. It must be starting to pull away from the bowl. Yeah, it is. It's pulling away from the bowl, starting to form a ball. It might not. Okay, so there you go. It's not a hard ball necessarily, but it is a moist dough, and that's going to be from the einkorn. But it's not sticky, super sticky to my fingers. So I'm just going to scrape it off of the dough hook. And I'm going to let it set. I'm going to cover it with something because you want to cover it with something breathable. And um, you don't want the flies or bugs or anything to get on it. So you can cover it with a, you know, dish towel or some kind of cloth. I have these that I got. Uh, I might have gotten them off Amazon like years ago. I can't really remember. But they have the elastic in them and they come in three different sizes. And so I really, I use them for everything. I love them. I really, I probably should get more because there's a lot of times I need... I need to cover more things and I have them all used up on other things. But anyway, so I'm going to cover it and set it aside for about an hour to start rising. And it might not get quite double before I start forming it, but it will, that hour will let that fresh ground einkorn to start absorbing some of those liquids. And then my dough won't be quite as, um, as sticky and soft. So I'm going to coat. I do like to use my cast iron loaf pans. You do not have to use cast iron. You can use whatever loaf pan you have. Or if you don't want to do a sandwich loaf, you can just make it into a big ball and do more like an artisan loaf. Whatever you want to do with this. 
but I am going to do two sandwich loaves with this. Uh, this recipe is for one, one loaf, but what I like to do um, when I keep it, when I make it into a sandwich loaf and I keep it just as one, it does rise a little too high. It gets a little, a little too puffy for what we like. So I do um, eyeball half. I, I mean, it ends up one's a little smaller than the other, but it's fine. We're not picky. We're just going to eat it. So, um, and I do, when I grease my loaf pans, I use coconut oil, extra virgin coconut oil. Um, but you can use whatever you like. I mean, I, I suppose even if you want to do, um, like if you're doing a cake and you do butter and then put flour on top of it, I mean, that's fine. The greasing it is just, you want to make sure that it doesn't stick. Whenever you take it out of the oven, you want to be able to dump it, dump your bread out onto the cooling rack and get it out of the pan easily without it getting torn up. So me uh, rubbing the coconut oil on it just keeps it from sticking and I get my bread comes out super easy every time. I am going to rub it on my hands because this dough still is slightly sticky and so I want to make sure it's not going to stick to my hands too bad. You see how much it rose. Looks really good. Nice and puffy. Has some good air bubbles in it. So I'm just going to scoop all of it out at first and I'm going to kind of fold it up. And then I'm going to try to find the middle as best I can without being super accurate. And I'm going to break it into two. And so to form my bread, there's going to be a pretty side and an ugly side. So I'm going to tuck everything and pull to where everything is being tucked to what will be the bottom. And then the pretty side is going to have a nice firm dome on top. You want that firm dome because as is it as it is expanding and rising in the oven, that firm dome with the pressure on top will help it keep its form. And so you do want to have, you know, the pretty side and the ugly side. The pretty side going up, the ugly side going down. And after it bakes and all evens out, you won't be able, you're not going to see all the creases or be able to tell that there was an ugly side. It'll just be the bottom of your loaf. And so here I'm going to do the second one. I'm just folding and tucking in there so I have nice firm top and you can roll this out and you know roll it on the counter um, and fold it up do it that way you don't have to you know fold and shimmy it down like I'm doing but I didn't feel like dirtying my counter or getting my roller dirty so this is just how I do it most of the time because I just I don't have time and usually I, I just don't want to dirty anything else to clean up because all I do is clean all day. So now that I have those formed, I'm going to put those on top of the stove and they're going to sit there covered so they can rest and rise a little bit while the oven is preheating to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're going to bake them for about 30 minutes. But I'm going to go ahead and cover them and keep them on the, the warm stove because you do want them to rest since we did mess with it, but it will help them do a little bit more of a rise being by that nice warm stove heating up. Okay, so now it's reached temperature. You can see the one closest to the camera that will end up being the larger loaf. And so you can see the top of it starting to rise back up. So now that the oven is at 350, I'm going to put them in the oven. I don't touch them next to each other in the oven. I do give them a little bit of space because I want to make sure that that airflow is going all the way around them. And I'm going to cook them for 30 minutes. And then when they are done, I'm going to take them out dump them onto the cooling rack and then let them cool on the cooling rack for at least 15 to 20 minutes. 30 minutes is best, but you want it at least 15 to 20 minutes because if you cut in them too soon, that's when you have that gummy texture. So you want them to be able to cool on the cooling rack out of the pan without being disturbed for at least 15 to 20 minutes and then you'll have that nice sandwich bread texture and you won't have any gumminess. So thank you for watching and I hope this was helpful and we'll see you on the next one.